All cool. right. Have fun. Okay. Thanks for coming. Uh, so Chris and I both work on Media Goblin, which is a decentralized media hosting project. It's a GNU project. It's AGPL. Um, and we wanted to, well, when we started Media Goblin, the goal was for it to be really easy for folks that aren't necessarily sysadmins to host their media on a free place, a smaller server, maybe something less large and corporate than, say, Flickr or YouTube. And uh, so we started building the software. And that uh, some parts of that were easy, some parts of that were hard. I'll, I'll leave Chris to that bit. But um, we kind of got into this place where we're like, all right, cool. So I kept pestering Chris, like, when can I have a Media Goblin installation? And, uh, and he's like, yeah, uh, well, it's over here. And I went through it a couple times. And I'm like, that's, that, no, no, that's like a pain in the butt. Um, and kept like kind of pushing on it. So we haven't quite gotten to that part yet. So we've been looking at different ways to make uh, Media Goblin super easy to install. And the reason for this is, uh, well, one, because we love freedom. And we want everyone to have it, not only sysadmins and developers. Uh, and then two, uh, not only are there lots of users that don't want to compile an application from source, uh, there are lots of people who would like to be on a network with folks that don't want to compile an application from source. Um, maybe you have family or friends or colleagues or neighbors that um, aren't interested in sysadmining their own instance of Media Goblin. Uh, Perhaps not, maybe you live in a, a hacker commune where everyone is excited to uh, install their own applications all the time. Uh, but for the rest of us, uh, that means that you either aren't on a network with folks that don't want to compile from source, or even worse, you have to compile all their applications for them and maintain them, which is also not so fun. Um, so that's the goal uh, here, is to get Media Goblin to be a super easy, uh, install that anyone can use. So, um, oh yeah. So, <laughs> are you going to talk about packaging first? So, tell me about the quest to package free software web apps so far, Chris. Uh, okay. So, I'd say that first of all, uh, most uh, Libre web applications are unfortunately at this time not actually as well packaged as we'd like them to be, uh, and so that actually, I in for distributions at least, so that usually means that. Uh, developers actually, uh, that people who wish to install them kind of have to fight with the language uh, packaging tools, which unfortunately means that uh, you're having to fight with Virtualun for Python and pip and stuff like that, or whatever, you know, your, your own, like NPM with like Node and, uh, or whatever your little kind of flavor of, of that moment is. And what that, that's somewhat, uh, so we, uh, we'd really like to get things packaged for distributions because unfortunately, a lot of that kind of you know language specific packaging stuff it means well one more tool to use and oftentimes they break in ways that actually require you to be kind of a language author in that language that happens to exist which obviously isn't great because we don't want this to be just for developers right we want this mm -hmm. to be usable for m much more than that so so i think at this point we can at least say yeah get distro to package free software web applications uh you know there um if we can get that to happen, that'd be great. There are some things that are happening, like Media Goblin is, for example, in the process of being packaged for Debian uh, by Simon FT uh, and some other people. But um, so there's there's progress, but we'd love to see more progress. So uh, so there. Cool. So uh, we just have to get it packaged for like maybe Fedora and a couple other distributions, and then we're done. Well, unfortunately. Uh, getting Libre applications packaged for uh, for distros uh, is a good first step, but there's a lot more that's needed than that. So what, like storage? What else? Well, okay. So I think I think a good way to be able to explain this is, you know, like how about email, right? Oh, all right, cool. So email we've had for a really long time. That should be pretty easy. Um, I mean, and I use like a dirty, dirty giant webmail. Uh, but am I lazy? Like, what do you use for your email? Well, okay. So let me describe to you my email setup. So what I do is I have uh, Dove, I have Postfix set up on my server to as my mail transfer agent, to, you know, so I can send and receive mail, uh, and then I have it uh, um, 
process through ProcMail so that it can uh, you know, filter everything out and, it can, and then I even type it to spam assassin so I can spam filter things. Oh, and then I, uh, uh, I download it from Dovecot. You know, I have things configured on my machine and on the server so that I can actually go and fetch it. Are you with me so far? Okay, and then when I pull it down onto my machine, I uh, index it with uh, something called MU. And then I open it up in MU4E, which is an Emacs, so I can read all my email in Emacs. And then it's super simple. Uh, you just have to remember how to configure all these applications and how to sync them all together. And, uh, and so, so even email, which has been around for a really long time, you think that you could just app get install email, but it, it doesn't seem to be quite that way. So, hmm. so, so, so email, uh, so you have to do all that stuff because you have to verify to the web and control your own spam and then sort it in a way you can look at it. Right. Yeah, so I'm there's a lot of that. configuration that's involved. Huh. Okay. Well, uh, so is that is that the case for all web applications? Like, couldn't you just, I don't know, smush your email solution into one thing and then we could use it for all the other web applications. So, so I think the thing is is that packaging helps. Uh, you know, the smushing the package, the, the configuration into the package. Right, packaging. Uh, packaging. Right, yeah, right, right. So can smushing the configuration into the package, well having a good default uh, configuration in the package helps somewhat, but I think that a significant of this part of this actually has to do with the need to do more configuration stuff within distributions. Huh, so more configuration. Right, so web applications have like a ridiculous amount of configuration stuff. You know, we have, and that can be helped somewhat. For example, in Debian, we have DebConf and friends, uh, and that's able to, you know, we can we can get to the part, uh, so we that's able to help, you know, fill in a lot of the gaps on certain parts of it, but if you, but it doesn't seem to kind of complete the whole, fi uh, pi uh, like the whole, the whole side of things, like, uh, if you if you want to try to sync things together, and I'm, I'm starting to go off here, but the <laughs> so wait, so you're saying the installer needs to actually touch all of these different variables for you to have a web application? Right, right. So okay, so we could start with minimalist configuration and some basic assumptions, which is often what times what we do, and then we can usually fit in like a certain amount of malleability uh, within the, uh, uh, the the application. But unfortunately, uh, there can't be like a Default settings? We can have default settings, but but it gets a little bit more complicated. Well, let's let's move on to find out why it gets more complicated. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so you don't just fill in all these variables and then ta-da, the web. Okay, right. So so for example, one of the ways in which things get more complicated is that a lot of these things require a lot of things kind of meshing together, right? So usually, for example, if we're going to install Media Goblin. You also need to be able to hook it up to Apache or Nginx or whatever like that, right? Okay. And unfortunately, that means that the the, the configuration of Apache or Nginx or whatever uh, means that it also needs to know about the Media Goblin <coughs> configuration, right? And I don't and distros are not really handling this type of thing because it's really hard to get those that configuration default stuff to happen to where it actually knows about each other. So that's really hard. And also, do we need to provide both? If, do we need to provide you know web like defaults? For Apache and Genex, like TTPD, you know, like uh, all of these different web applications, like so, that seems like that's starting to get pretty complex at that point, right? Yeah, absolutely. And in, in, not to mention, not to mention, it gets even more complex. I don't know how to use the thing. It stopped working. I'm gonna use this keyboard. Okay. <laughs> no, that didn't work either. Oh, right, this one. Speaking of complexity. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, unfortunately, even more complex is SSL, DNS, and et cetera, right? So you have your web application, and then you want to have it be secure, and you actually want it to even appear on your domain name. And unfortunately, that also not only requires interconnecting different things, like you know, interconnecting with uh, your, the SSL certs that you generate, which is a big pain in the butt uh, process for anybody who's actually done such a thing, but also hooking up those SSL certificates requires, and with DNS and et cetera, that requires that you actually go over to some sort of other organization which has some authority, right? And you need to actually configure, it, configure stuff on their web server, 
and you, uh, on their, through their web configuration stuff and sync things back and forth, right? You need to copy over your key. You also need to set up the DNS stuff, and then you need to set that up back in your server and need to hook that up in your Media Goblin config and then hook it up in your Apache config. And at that point, everything's starting to get frustrating, and you also need to have your Apache config probably has some of the same settings as your mail, as your mail transfer agent, but not quite the same settings. And, and so it's starting to get a big mess at that point. Well, but so going back to the email example, so when we used to, uh, you know, the web was slow and you would download your email to like something super old like Pegasus and like be dating myself here, you would just take, uh, you know, there was like once or twice a year or maybe, you know, you'd have to go in and remember what your IMAP was and your POP was and like what your outgoing email address was for real and, and set all that stuff up. So like couldn't you just... You know, so it would suck maybe like once every other year, but then you'd be good for the interim. Right. So that uh, that so that one is in a couple slides. Oh. Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> so so, but before we get to that one, uh, let's get to the frustration of uh, unless if I messed up my slides. Uh, the as the with the issues of databases, right? Okay. Because databases themselves are also another issue of frustration, right? Because usually. Uh, your database ends up being frustrating because it also, uh, um, because, well, usually databases do upgrade themselves, like the, the, the database configuration does handle, well, man, Postgres, when I recently upgraded it several times on Debian testing, I had to basically dump my DB and import it in several times. But the more frustrating thing is that web applications, when they get upgraded, usually you have to go through something like migrations in order to be able to keep the same schema valid between all the different upgrades. And that's something that, isn't necessarily easy to handle all the time within applications like packaging, uh, although you potentially can, but it's just one extra extra bit of frustration. So, so. Okay, so what if I just ask my friend Chris to set up my Media Goblin instance on his machine? Okay, so you're saying that we will have media.dustdaycloud.org and media.eximiusproductions.com on the same server in order to simplify things, right? Well, for me. Maybe okay. not for you. Well, unfortunately for me, that would make things even more complicated because if the distros could actually be able to provide a bunch of defaults for all these applications, none of the distros have a, a particularly a way to be able to provide these for multiple instances of the application, right? So if you have media if you went through DevConf and DevConf was setting up default values for um, your Media Goblin instance, it would probably set up the default values for one Media Goblin instance. But the type of infrastructure that isn't doesn't seem to be there in order to be able to install things for, you know, it, and this gets more complicated all the way up the chain of things that I've already said are co more complicated, right? Both configuring the application and configuring the web server and all that stuff, it means that you need to actually have a configuration layer that's able to handle multiple sites here. So that's actually, if we're hoping to have this somewhat fixed within these types of steps and the tools that we already have, that actually makes it harder for me to deploy onto this server. Huh, okay. Yeah. So, but at least once it's set up, it's good? Well, well, okay, so now you've got your machines actually set up and configured, right? But keeping your machines up right. to date. But with all the different, yeah. Yeah, okay. all the different layers of things can actually itself be really complex, right? So, so what happens the next time that heart bleed happens, right? And by the time, uh -huh. at this point, you've got eight servers, right? And you have to go out and update all those servers, right? Which is one of the reasons why DevOps is growing in popularity and et cetera, right? Um, and, or you have an intrusion detected. Part of the problem is, since you've been configuring all these things by hand, since you know I decided I'm going to end up, you know, like I've set up the server and then I decided, oh yeah, I'm gonna also handle dev server on the same thing. And now I have this yeah. kind of special, snow, unique snowflake of a server, right? And I changed all these configuration parameters and I updated all these things. And now when I have to go install a new server, I am like terrified to ever shut down the old VM because I'm terrified, did I actually remember all of the things that I changed, all the packages I installed, all the configuration files I put in some specific place? I don't know. And so like I might shut down that server, I'll deactivate it from there, and then I, oh, I, I forgot something really important. I don't even remember how I set it up. So the special snowflakeness of setting up and maintaining a server makes it extra hard to be able to keep this going. Uh, maybe, so maybe something, everything just broken, you need to move, but it's moving could be really hard at that point. Hmm. So I didn't do this whole talk to just convince everyone in this room to be depressed. Are you sure? <laughs> so at this point, maybe we should talk about things that might be able to help. Okay. Uh, so um, 
We've been hearing lots about containers. Containers are kind of the new hotness. Aren't they going to like fix everything, like all those kinds of things that are a pain in the butt? Well, containers are interesting because it is a way to be able to provide isolation to the application that you're doing. And one of the big complaints has been, oh, it's so hard to be able to you know, install like this application, it requires all these dependencies and you have to keep those things up and you know, we don't have the equivalent of like, you know, like Linus Torvalds is getting angry. Linus, I don't really care about Linus Torvalds, but he's getting angry anyway and so a bunch of other people on the internet are getting angry because he had some problem with the cat video. So they're like, oh, but, but Docker will fix it, right? Because Docker's gonna package all the stuff in there. And, but now you've got a container full of dependencies that are going, becoming outdated, and that's not really helpful. Oh. Um, but hmm. it might helpful as in terms of having process isolation, right? In terms of like maybe some sort of specific vulnerability is found within this application, it might be helpful if your design, uh, container is in, uh, designed in a very secure way that's not like Docker, that it will be able to like, uh, that like you won't be able to leak out of it and mess up the rest of the system. So containers might be able to help, but the current thing that's happening is if you have a bunch of different, if you're, if you're envisioning this future where containers are magic going to fix all the things because Docker has a really cool logo, that might actually not entirely fix things because it is cool. it is a, it's a really cool logo. I'm not making fun of it, um, though I, I am making fun of some things. Uh, the, uh, but the, uh, um, but like, you know, Docker is also kind of at the point where, you know, it's like, sure, we have a base image for the install and then you can build like smaller adjustments up from there, but you're still kind of ending up in the, the world of like one gigabyte per binary. So I'm not really sure if this entirely fixes the world that we want. And yes, it has a configuration management system like that to be able to set up and deploy things. But if you have, a, what I think what we really need is a more generic configuration management system. So some kind of like a DevOps super tool to provide some kind of nice abstraction layer? Right, actually. So I actually think that one, like you know, the whole world of Ansible, Salt, and Chef, and stuff like that, is actually um, an interesting place to explore. Right. So the whole DevOps world, but I don't think it's a full solution on its own. Um, and part of the thing is, is that like DevOps is focused on developers, right? Dev. It's got Dev in the name, right? It's developer oriented, and it also seems to be oriented at people who are working for big corporations, right? Like. We don't really, while individual hackers can use it presumably to take care of their servers, it's still a big extra layer of things to have to learn on top of everything else you have to learn. It doesn't seem to be simplifying the number of things that you have to learn in the universe. It's like now it can maybe help you take care of all the other things that you've learned how to take care of, right? Um, so, but it has a really good idea. It is a really great, it does seem to be that the whole idea of declarative, declarative systems does seem to be an idea that's moving in the right direction, right? So I think, I think as in terms of our potentially good ideas, we should keep this one at the top of our heads and then think about a little bit more how we might integrate it. Okay, so uh, maybe we can make it more GUI friendly and then we can call it DevOps. DevOps yeah. after Deb? Okay, yeah, so it's Deb's idea, make it more GUI friendly, and so we'll call it DevOps. So what would DevOps be, right? Can I so trademark that now? Yeah, you should trademark it, right? Okay. You know, I think there's been talks on trademarks and everybody will approve it. Uh, so, um, so I actually do think that GUI systems on top of configuration management systems might help a lot, right? So if you built maybe some abstract concepts of recipes on top of your configuration systems, uh, maybe you could actually build some recipes from which you don't necessarily have to know about everything that's within that recipe in order to be able to deploy it, right? So, um, so I in some distro people have been talking about this, but as far as I know, like distributions have not actually been working to try to incorporate the same level of the configuration management things into their distribution, and certainly not in a way that's like oriented towards like graphical user interfaces. But good idea. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so we have a long list of things that won't work on their own. Do you wanna like uh, go through what those incomplete solutions are? Well, we could. Uh, so, so it seems like containers alone don't seem to fix it because of all the reasons I, I complained about. And configuration management seems, systems seem to be in a good direction of things, but they're a little bit too corporate and DevOps focused, right? But what if we take some of these ideas and we start to move around with them a little bit further? So. Uh, so maybe some solutions to explore. Uh, some of these are kind of more of a call to action. So the configuration system with recipe thing, I think is actually something that could be really useful. Uh, DevOps is focused on developers, usually working for large companies, but what if, 
what if we, uh, uh, but, and you can use them for user-oriented stuff, but it's not really nicely uh, optimized for it, but what if there were ways um, to be able to kind of share this? The current state of sharing it is, oh, well, I uploaded some recipes to GitHub, right? So you just go find those, and it's basically the same as like, you know, like, as like having a solution, right? Except that's not, you have to edit those by hand and et cetera, but what if we could take it a little bit further? You know, what if we went from DevOps to user ops, right? Um, or DevOps, you know, DevOps is also good, right? <laughs> but like, but if we, uh, I can fork it and call mine. You could call yours DevOps, right. Okay. right? You know, maybe yours is the DevOps implementation of the user ops concept, right? So, um, but if you take configuration management systems, and if you think that they have these various places in which you know you need to be able to specify certain things, you need to specify your domain name here. You need to specify uh, specify you know like which plugins you have here and stuff like that. You can think those are some variables that users can hook in, right? So and if you think about, well, what if we ended up describing what types of things are associated with those variables? This one's a text box, this one's you know, basically a drop down, this one's blah, blah, blah. If we were able to describe that and then prevent, uh, preside, present a graphical user interface that actually showed the user um, which things they could select from, this might be a good step in the right direction, right? And then, you know, if we could build these in a way so that they were specifically designed to be able to set up like you, where they're multi-deployable so that you could basically say, I'm deploying this one a, a few times, then we could both have Deb's thing and my thing on the ma same machine. And we're not stuck to the same constraints that exist in DevConf and th et cetera. Um, and if we actually, if distributions, so I think this is a thing where distributions as they exist now maybe could start thinking about solutions of having an additional layer, like an additional layer on top of apt and yum and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is something worth exploring. Um, I don't have this as a complete answer. I've been experimenting with some things on my own, but I think that this is something worth thinking about. Okay. So another thing that I think is interesting and worth thinking about <laughs> is, uh, you know, well, functional distros are really interesting to me right now. So. That's not a complete solution on its own, but I do like the idea of declarative systems. And moving declarative systems outside of just the configuration la uh, language and also moving it towards the distribution itself does seem to be a good idea. Maybe you can apply some of the other ideas on top of that. And it does seem like distributions are playing around with this more. And of course we have Nix and Geeks and stuff like that that are playing with this quite a lot. Um, but of course, um, and so the ability to deploy something and also be able to step back and forth if something goes wrong is probably very helpful, especially in the many cases you know that we described as problems earlier. Um, but of course, you know, functional distributions probably carry some of the same problems that functional programming have, right? As in terms of we need a user story that's clearer than any of the existing explanations of what a monad is and how it works, right? Wait, you're gonna explain to users how monads work? No, 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 I'm saying we, we want to not have to do it. So right, so okay, if we okay, explore okay. some of these ideas of functional distributions, we better do a better job than we are currently of explaining the concepts behind functional programming. I that's think they I'm could thinking. use a new name, actually, to Maybe? start with. Monads? Monads, yeah. what's, it, what's your new name? Uh, uh, Devnads? No. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't think that through <laughs> before I said it. <laughs> well, that uh, was improvised in the talk and not very well. Uh, we'll take suggestions uh, later. Okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Okay, so. Anything better than that. Uh, so moving on. Moving on. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a picture of this up here, but the, uh, um, but so there is something interesting happening with uh, uh, Sandstorm, I think, as has an interesting set of concepts, right? And well, uh, if you want, Ashish is in the back. Ashish is in the back. Ashish would love to talk to you about Sandstorm. You can ask him about it, and he will give you at minimum a half hour explanation, probably. Uh, <laughs> and he has stickers uh, and shirts. Uh, but there, there are some interesting things happening with uh, Sandstorm that actually I think fit into the things that I said earlier. Uh, you can, uh, uh, not to mention the fact that uh, they have a good logo. Uh, yeah, nicer than Walker, Docker even. Uh, and I can't type. That's really bad. So. You're typing, it's just not been set in. Yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's. So the machine is broken, not his hand. Maybe in it's this In case you thing. guys were gonna like call whatever 911 is. Yeah, I, my hands work. Um, it works here. I think it's You'll just. You'll have to get it from Ashish, the logo. You're gonna have to get it from Ashish, yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> oh, oh, even, wait, it works here. <laughs> it works here, so I'm gonna transfer it over. Chromium no longer likes me. Okay, we're gonna switch it over here. There we go. Oh, <laughs> Chromium stole the game. There it is. 
There's, there's Sam Strom. So Sam Strom has some good ideas, I think, actually. Uh, one of the ideas that it has that's good, uh, although now I've lost my notes, uh, is uh, that, um, that it is container-based, but it's container-based in a way that's, that's, uh, that's deployable and it's not just like I'm handing you this large distribution inside of this huge, like basically binary that you have no way to, to do anything with and that will slowly come out of out of date and you have no plans on how to update it later, right? So Sandstorm has some better ideas than that. Uh, one of them is that it does actually have a nice web user interface where you can just go and click and install something. Uh, and in fact, Ashish cajoled me before uh, before this conference uh, to set up on mediagoblin.org mediagoblin.org uh, so that you can see an example of this. So we you we have it right here. Hand. You can click try a demo now. Let's see if this works live. <laughs> and you can just click try Media Goblin, and it sets up a throwaway instance that will disappear later. Um, but there, it just set up a, an instance right now. Uh, so one of the interesting things behind this is that it's container-based, but the way that the containers actually exist is they, uh, um, uh, they, you don't end up writing any user data inside of the container. You actually write it all to there. That's right, Ashish, right? Yeah, so, the, uh, um, so when you're upgrading the, the thing, you're actually just upgrading the container, and then all the user's data wasn't even in the container anyway. So the upgrade is pretty simple. Um, also, uh, the it it functions like a sandbox so that it doesn't, uh, the security-wise, it doesn't leak out to the rest of your stuff, right? right? So it uses a capability-based security model, also something interesting to explore, where uh, um, to be able to keep things contained and be able to keep it so that your, your server is able to, you can constrain what types of things that are happening so you're not totally screwing everything up. But the, uh, um, but the, I th and I, so I think this has a lot of good ideas, especially because that all of that magic, it's, it's mostly hidden from people who don't want to have to know it which I think is really great as in terms of uh, uh, exploring a lot of these ideas. I will give some caveats. I've given Ashish most of these caveats, so Ashish is thinking about them. Uh, some of these caveats are, for example, uh, I don't know why it has this iframe thing, uh, and it's confusing to me. Ashish will probably explain that, um, but he's not up here, but he can maybe answer from the audience if he feels like he has a good explanation. Okay, that thanks, Sashish. Uh, so the, the some of the other things that I think are a bit odd are um, it does use capability security, which is awesome. Uh, and as I've expressed to Ashish, so Ashish has uh, assured me on quite a few things. I do think the capability uh, ca security does uh, require redoing certain parts of your application, which is a bit messy. Uh, and it also uh, um, it also means that uh, um, that current applications are considered legacy applications as opposed to the future of Sandstorm applications, which is hilarious wording. Um, the, uh, um, and and the, it's kind of, for me right now, it's kind of hitting the uncanny valley of deployment. Like it's almost, like it's almost what I would see as like a good deployment system. But then like there's some parts about, who here is familiar with the uncanny valley? Okay, quite a few people. For those of you who don't, it's like when in computer graphics and et cetera, you have like some sort of realistic looking human, like Chun characters, you can get away with the animation being worse and et cetera than you can with realistic characters because the more the realistic you get, it gets. the closer it gets, the more creepy it gets when they're not quite right. So like it's the uncanny valley for me where like this is coming so close to what I want that like the things that are not right are like really bothering me. But hopefully I can keep annoying Ashish about them and then they will get better over time. Uh, I'll help you with that. Yeah, okay, <laughs> don't worry. We're really good at annoying Ashish. We have years of practice. So, um, so yeah, so that's about Sandstorm. Uh, wow, that's really confusing. I'm gonna take that. Uh, so so let's, let's go on to the last slide, which is, uh, um, I think last of all, uh, uh, experimenting, which I have the same slide most or less that I had this morning, except now it's an app here, which is from the FSF, like make the future thing. Um, but I think that I think that what really needs to happen is that uh, um, is is that distros need to be willing to experiment with these ideas and actually consider that some of the existing tools I don't think that packaging as it exists right now is sufficient uh, for all the reasons that I've explained um, and 
could distros play a future in helping users be able to get to the point where we're not stuck in such a shitty world where everybody's running Gmail and et cetera, right? And that requires that distros be willing to take on that next layer of things and mess around with these things and, and probably fail sometimes, but actually, you know, maybe succeed at others, right? So, yeah. so con experimentation, I think, is the last major component of what might help, which is, I know, a super weak sauce, like, last slide in a certain sense, but also a, an empowering one in another, right? Sure, and uh, <laughs> you can talk to us while you experiment. Yeah, that's right. We're more than happy. Or sheesh. Yeah, or sheesh. Um, so here are some credits. Here's some more credits. And finally, here's a thanks that has ta taken together all the ingredients previously shown in the, slide, uh, the, uh, the presentation and brought to you as a banana clip. Uh, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Oh, and we specifically left time for questions and comments because we'd love to hear if there are things that people are working on that we don't know about or uh, uh, parts that go in the banana split that we didn't think of or things that um, you think that we d left out as far as, uh, you know, we, we want to hear from you guys about uh, what, what you'd like to see happen next. So any questions or comments? You. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh, you mean you so the the comment is that functional uh, distributions don't need functional programming. They can be done with um, declarative stuff, but more parentheses. Yes. So so geeks basically. Uh, the so so uh, I, I I do agree. Like you don't necessarily have to be a functional programmer in order to understand these things. But I think that also parentheses are probably not enough either, right? We need some <laughs> layers on top of parentheses because like. I love parentheses. Like, I am a parentheses <laughs> fan. Um, if you saw my high talk yesterday, it was like, like it's like high, I, as I described it, which is a list that transforms into the Python abstract syntax tree. Hilarious, and you should check it out. Uh, I just, as I described hilarious. it. Hilarious? Yeah, hilarious. Uh, you know, like, I mean, like, I, I personally am of the view of why I write stuff in, like, readable Python code when you can add more parentheses, right? Because I love parentheses. Yeah. But the, the, but I do think that, like, I, I, as much as I think I would be happy messing around in a parenthesis environment, I want people who never are going to touch lists to be able to get into this type of stuff, right? But I, I, I do agree, you know, it's not necessarily that you have to be a functional programmer to get into this stuff because of declarative stuff, right? But like, uh, and, and I think functional programming can really bring us, a, like functional package managers can really bring us a long way. Um, and that's why I brought it in there, you know, but, the, but I, I, I think that even with the functional pa package managers, we have to think of that next layer up for kind of like the user stuff, which thankfully, if you're in a declarative environment, you know, like list is great. When you have a lot of parentheses, it's very easy to design a d domain specific language for that next layer of things. So maybe that's what we should be doing. Uh, yeah. Uh, Yeah, I, so I, the w I think we're supposed to repeat. Oh yeah, yeah, we should repeat. Yeah, it. so we should have a mailing list for this stuff because it's a big problem that lots of people want to work on. Is the comment, and uh, I think Chris is about to say that he's he's into that. Yeah, I'm into that. Uh, is the first one. Yeah, Deb was right. She she knows we've been working long enough together, yeah, but yeah, you know yeah. that I'm into that. Uh, so um, so actually, uh, I'm actually. Could it be a media goblin mailing list? Well, it could be. We could have it at mediagoblin.org. Uh, the I think Ashish might actually know more about this. I know that Debian had one of these, right, for quite a long time, but it's been very inactive, but we want this to be broader than Debian too, right? Um, so do you know of anything else that's like this? Like, there, I, I have a feeling I might be missing something obvious, but I actually think that, so you don't think there is anything. So yeah, I think you're right. Okay, so the, the answer is there's a distributions at freedesktop.org uh, mailing list, okay. And we could use that as a way to be able to start this. All right, well, I will hop on the distributions mailing list after this talk, and hopefully you will as well, and maybe we can use that as a start. Um, but I do, agree that, I do agree that we should have something like this to discuss beyond this presentation, because you're right, this is a big problem, and this presentation you know, is helpful in pointing out some ideas, but the, the, you know, uh, 
the ongoing work on this and ongoing thinking is what's really important. Um, yeah. And I mean, Oh, the liberation tech liberation list. Tech list? Yes. I was going to say, anyone who wants to ping press at mediagoblin.org, uh, we will point you to the correct list once we've, if, if it turns out that one of the ones that was mentioned here is more dead than previously assumed. You know, so maybe maybe we need to do an assessment of this afterwards and uh, figure out whether or not something is sufficient. We could try the distributions thing, or maybe not. We'll end up starting a new one or something. But I think we can figure out a mailing list. We'll, we'll figure out a mailing list thing. Uh, okay, but anyway, great response. Uh, other questions? There was one in the middle here. Oh, okay. Speak up a little, please. Okay. Uh, so uh, he's saying there's a Debian-based distribution called Symbios? Symbios? Symbiosis. Oh, 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 like the two animals that brush each other's teeth. Okay. And so uh, I got it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a little bird in the crocodile. Anyways. Um, uh, but that, he's saying that one has solved the email problem, but not uh, all the web application stuff. So that, uh, th that's a great comment. It's nice to know that there is a, a distribution that solved the email stack thing. It's, yeah. it's still hard, it's very hard, is what he's saying. Okay. Uh, also, I think we just found a mascot for DevConf, which is a animal brushing another animal's teeth. What do you think? Uh, so uh, <laughs> any, any other comments or questions? Or Okay, yeah, you. Okay, so actually, that's a great question. The question is, when we're talking about users installing something, are they talking about installing it on their desktop or on a, on a web server or something? I think it should be either, right? You know, I actually think that, like, and there have been a lot of these attempts that have been like, let's install it on this specific tiny device that you run in your house, or let's install it on, you know, Shiva and a lot. Shiva plug. Yeah, a Shiva box. plug, you know, with the Freedom Box and stuff. And I think a lot of these have been, had noble goals, but, you know, like, we don't have a specific app that's just for servers versus home uh, machines. I think that it, it makes sense to be able to have something that people can, that's for any of these servers, right? This is a generic enough problem where it should be able to work for your home machines you know, or your servers. So I actually think the answer is either, right? It should be as generic as apps, basically. Um, or, or, or yum, I'm sorry, I'm probably offending all sorts of distributions by saying apps so much, but anyway. Oh, so the question was, if you're inst if they're if they're installing it on the desktop, does that mean their desktop is going to become a server, right? That they have to. Um, well, so the desktop as a server thing is complicated because IPv4 and et cetera and stuff like that. Um, so the, the I, you know, if it was possible, if network routing worked in a great way where you could make your desktop a a server, you know, I know there's at least one person in the audience who has you know a local machine at his home that he runs uh, some free uh, Libre network services stuff on. Um, so I think that's great if you could do that. Um, you know, like whether or not, you know, a lot of the stuff isn't really desktop software, but if the net, if the internet worked a little bit differently, if we had IPv6, there's probably no reason you couldn't, right? Um, but the, the, but I, I, I actually think that there might be, there might be a parallel, with the one parallel that comes in here with desktop software and application software coming in sync is that even with people's desktops, I think people are hitting the frustration that's like, you know, if my desktop shuts down, you know, like, like it's going to be really annoying for me to reproduce, unless if you're using a functional package manager with, with parentheses, it's going to be really difficult and annoying for me to get my, my desktop back the way that it was before, right? And so that's mm -hmm. actually where the parallel happens, even though it's not necessarily about server software, I think. Uh, do we have more time or did we just run out? Uh, Five minutes. Okay. okay, great. So we can take like one more question, maybe? Depending on how long.
Oh, could there be a way to have technical people maintain your server as a user without accessing your data? And uh, I see Ashish is wanting to say that Sandstorm kind of uh, So are you going to have Tahoe Sandstorm L LEFS at some point? Yeah, so we have a little bit of a problem with that because we have been trying to basically do everything on the same on the same policy path so that we can get that information to that point. Okay, right. so go to the Sandstorm site if you want to work on uh, that kind of encapsulation, uh, if I'm using that word correctly in that context. Okay. Do uh, we have any, uh, like one more quick one? Yeah. So I I can't wait for us to have this conversation on the mailing list. Yeah. Uh, did you have a, a follow-on or uh, or another a note? Why is there a need? Oh, okay. oh, why do people want to control why? their own data and have it on their own server? Right. So we didn't cover that. I mean, Deb and I have given. I guess. I guess probably the reason why we didn't do it is because Deb and I talk about that in every other presentation we give, and so like we are like Dipto room. Uh, you know, like, but, 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 yes, it's worth talking about. So, why do that? Uh, in fact, I have a slide from a whole other presentation, um, and I might as well just bring it up. Um, maybe not on this, because that doesn't work. Um, yeah, I don't know. Or maybe I can't type anymore. So, no, I'm not going to bring it up. But the short answer is right. So, the internet has become a scarier and scarier place, right? Like Gmail, for example. Email used to be a, a federated protocol, and how many people actually run their own email servers now, right? I do, right? And then my stuff mysteriously hits <laughs> Gmail user spam and nobody else, and it's a black box, and I can't find out why because Gmail doesn't use the same stuff as everyone else, and that's frustrating. And so, like, the fe like that's just one example of many of, like, even the things that we had that were previously decentralized are all becoming more and more centralized, right? Like, everything is becoming more and more centralized right now while we know that centralization is killing us, right? Like, the NSA is able to read all our shit right? Like, we are screwed. And yet, we can't get ourselves out of this situation because we are stuck relying on, hey, Google, right? You know, we're, we're stuck relying on that company, you know, to do all our stuff, right? We need to, we need a way to be able to break out of that. So, so I think that that's a simple explanation. But the, part, the answer is, right now, when you tell somebody, yes, we need to be running our own things, et cetera, et cetera, Okay. Uh, why is I think we are just about out of time, and uh, what I'm going to say is that uh, we will be blogging post this event, and we'll share the slides on the MediaGoblin.org uh, blog. And we once we've figured out what this mailing list is going to be, uh, that will also be posted on our website. I hope that you will all come. Uh, take a look there, join the mailing list, join the conversation. Uh, we clearly have a bubble over of much more conversation that needs to happen. So we look forward to having that with you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.